there's just two weeks until the Beijing Winter Olympics begin, more star athletes are giving a voice to ongoing concerns about China's human rights. Some defend the nation, while others accuse it. The International Olympic Committee is under fire. A U.S. politician wants to introduce legislation to sanction the head of the organization. A Chinese group chat from one neighborhood is warning residents don't break lockdown orders. It lists a number of intimidating consequences for violators and advises people to stay at home. A 10-year investigation exposes a process fueling the U.S. opioid crisis. It involves a laundry list of actors, including casinos, Beijing officials, money laundering and criminal gangs. And another European nation is backing Taiwan. Its leaders say the island is the legitimate successor of mainland China. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Two weeks and counting before the Beijing Winter Olympics kick off. But as the opening ceremony looms, international attention is zeroing in on China's human rights situation. Now, more star athletes are getting involved. Boston Celtics center NS Cantor Freedom has been outspoken in his criticism of human rights abuses in China. He responded to a request to visit China from former NBA star Yao Ming on social media on Wednesday. I want to be very clear. I have nothing against Chinese people. My problem is with the cultish Chinese Communist Party and the brutal dictator Xi Jinping. I would like to come to China this summer and see everything with my own eyes. But on this trip, will we be able to visit the Uyghur slave labor camps or visit the innocent woman being tortured, raped and abused? Will we get to see how the regime destroys bodies after harvesting their organs so there is no evidence? Or Will you show me propaganda only? Freedom went on to ask if they could visit Taiwan, Tibet and Hong Kong together and pointed out how Chinese communist rule or the threat of it has adversely affected them. Yao Ming was a longtime player with the Houston Rockets until 2011. And while working as a promotion ambassador, he helped Beijing win its bid to host the Winter Olympics. Yao is now president of the state-controlled Chinese Basketball Association. Linked to the increasing scrutiny on China's human rights, last month a Chinese state media journalist posted a photo and clip of Yao and Chinese tennis star Peng Shui together. The images were shared on Twitter, which is blocked in China, suggesting the content may have been intended to be seen by those outside China. Peng is former tennis women's doubles world champion. She has been at the center of an international storm since last November, when she accused a former Chinese Communist Party leader of sexual assault. Soon after, her post was quickly scrubbed from Chinese social media. Earlier this week, Yao addressed his encounter with Peng, describing her as in pretty good condition. But the Women's Tennis Association has continued its calls for a thorough and transparent investigation into Peng's allegations and suspended all tournaments in China over her safety. Japanese tennis star Naomi Osaka praised the Women's Tennis Association's move regarding Peng Shui. Osaka has won the last Australia Open. And at a press conference for the ongoing Australia Open, the defending champion said everyone is waiting for more information about Pong. The WTA, the whole organization, they handled it really well, and I'm really, you know, proud um, of them. And I think, I don't know, I feel like it's a situation where we need more information, which is definitely really hard. Um, so kind of, I think everyone is waiting. The International Olympic Committee, or IOC, is taking heat. Politicians and athletes are denouncing the organization for what they say is the committee's complicity towards Beijing's human rights violations. Germany's triple Olympic medalist Eric Lesser said the IOC should face any criticism over Beijing being given the right to host the Winter Olympics. 
He tells a German newspaper that we are now standing here having to justify ourselves for the Olympic Games being held in a country where human rights are violated. So in turn, we have to be more critical about what Thomas Bach, as president of the IOC, did not achieve. Meanwhile, in the U.S., Wisconsin Representative Mike Gallagher says he will introduce legislation to sanction the International Olympic Committee. It's for the IOC's alleged collaboration with Beijing in the incident involving Chinese tennis player Peng Shuai. During the time when Peng Shuai disappeared from public view, IOC President Thomas Bach held virtual meetings with her. It seemed to be to show that she was safe and well. Gallagher tells Fox News that the IOC provided cover for the Chinese Communist Party and echoed the CCP's account of the events surrounding her disappearance. He says it's no longer enough to call for an Olympic boycott and that it's time to slap sanctions on IOC President Thomas Bach. If you're a sports fan in the United States, you may find the Winter Olympics on TV this year missing something. With the event in Beijing almost here, the official Olympics broadcaster in the U.S., NBC, announced on Wednesday that it will not be sending any announcing teams to China, citing COVID concerns. An NBC spokesperson told USA Today they had scheduled broadcasting teams to announce from Beijing covering figure skating, alpine skiing and snowboarding. However, as of Wednesday, those plans have been cancelled. Instead, the network will be managing the broadcasts remotely from Stanford, Connecticut. NBC's Olympic host Mike Tirico will still be in China for the first few days of the Games before traveling to Los Angeles to cover the Super Bowl. Though no NBC play-by-play teams will be at the event in Beijing, there will still be NBC reporters. But human rights and press freedom groups have voiced concerns. Specifically, the ability for the journalists to freely report during the Olympics, especially with China's crackdown on press freedom. NBC said on Wednesday its coverage would include perspectives on China's place in the world and the geopolitical context of the Games, but adds its focus is still on the athletes. The coverage plans followed the urging of human rights groups and the U.S. government to cover China's rights violations and protests during the Olympics. NBC Olympics executive producer says their reporters will be at all Olympic venues, saying if something happens, we'll have our own cameras on site. But earlier this week, the International Olympic Committee said no tickets would be sold for the Beijing Games. Instead, spectators must be invited by the organizers in Beijing to attend the Games in person. And in Beijing, a new accusation is hitting the Internet. Officials are blaming international mail from Canada for allegedly bringing the first case of the Omicron variant to the city. The infection was first reported on Saturday. Two days later, in a press conference, Beijing CDC claimed it has found traces of the virus on pieces of mail the patient had received. The deputy director said the mail originated in Canada and traveled through the U.S. and Hong Kong before arriving in Beijing. The official then urged Beijing residents to reduce overseas purchases to avoid foreign mail. But the new directive is raising some red flags. Back when the pandemic first broke out in Wuhan, China Post confirmed that the risk of virus transmission through the mail is extremely low. And that's not the only contradiction. In the earlier stages of the pandemic, international calls to boycott Chinese products also started to rise over fear of possible contamination. To fight back, the Chinese regime published an article on its official website last March. The piece was titled, Coronavirus on Chinese Exports. This claim lacks common sense. It argues against claims that the virus can survive on object surfaces, calling the idea not scientifically based and contrary to the facts. It goes on to explain that the virus can only survive inside a host and quickly dies out without one within just four to 72 hours. As for the most recent postal infection claim, in Canada, doctors are rebuking Beijing's accusation. I find this to be a, let's say an extraordinary uh, view. While other leaders have offered similar takes. I uh, heard that story and found it quite comical. O'Toole described the claim as a reminder that some reports coming out of China cannot be trusted. Just how far will China take its so-called zero-COVID policy? And how tough will lockdown measures get inside the country?
A group chat among residents from one neighborhood in the city of Xi'an lists reasons why people ought to follow the rules or else. Within the message group, a post cites 10 reasons to stay in line. Most of them highlight the consequences of violating stay-at-home orders. Topping the list, the first warning reads, your home will be surrounded by police cars and ambulances and will be sealed. Next, the post warns that pandemic control staff will come for anyone who breaks the rules and will take him or her away. But worth noting, the post doesn't actually use the term pandemic control staff. Instead, it references masked white robes. The full warning reads, you will be dragged away by masked white robes like butchers who slaughter pigs. The post also addresses men's best friend. It states that rule breakers' pets will be slaughtered. It goes on to cite official policy wording, describing a treatment to make pets harmless. Like many of the list's other warnings, reports at least one related case surfaced back in November in eastern China. A woman there was taken to a no-pets-allowed quarantine site and had to leave her dog at home. She had had the pet for five years. The health workers promised not to harm the dog. But while watching remote feed from a camera inside her home, she witnessed two men in protective suits entering the space. Once inside, they cornered her pet, hitting it with what looks like an iron rod. The dog is seen trying to get away, but wasn't successful. Then the men later backed the animal in plastic. After the incident, the pet owner shared the tragic video online. Uproar soon exploded online. Amid the criticism, authorities posted a notice saying, workers on site treated the dog to make it harmless without thorough communication with the netizen, the dog owner. As for the remainder of the group chat's warning list, one point notes that officials may choose to quarantine apartment buildings, communities, or even entire towns, all if just a single person violates lockdown orders. While the final consequence describes going through quarantine without smartphones or other devices, as officials may decide to confiscate them. In Hong Kong, more than 2,000 hamsters are slated to be killed, and small animal imports will be suspended after one pet shop worker tested positive for the Delta variant. Authorities in Hong Kong have issued a new pandemic control order. That's after a pet shop worker and 11 hamsters from the same shop were confirmed to have the virus. Now workers are rounding up the animals from pet shops and putting them down. On Thursday morning, some residents handed in their hamsters for culling by city order. The volunteers intercepted most of the creatures for safekeeping. About a dozen hamster lovers also flocked to a government facility attempting to save as many of the animals as possible. In fact, the hamsters are innocent. They cannot be sentenced to death because of the virus. We all feel depressed and blame ourselves for not being able to help. So we are here today to save them. It's not like every small animal is going to be infected, right? And they all have their own life. They should not be just killed like this. Hong Kong authorities did not immediately respond to a request for comment on the volunteers' actions. Those updates follow other turmoil from Wednesday. That's when Hong Kong health workers took to pet shops for culling. Even though scientists and Hong Kong health authorities say animals are not likely to transmit COVID-19 to humans, Hong Kong still decided to put them down in pursuit of its zero-tolerance policy for COVID-19. As the Hong Kong health secretary said on Tuesday, she could not rule out any possibilities for transmission. Authorities also closed dozens of pet shops and suspended imports and sales of small mammals. What's more, they ordered anyone who bought hamsters after December 22nd last year to turn in their animals for culling. But residents are questioning the directive. Uh, I think it's unethical and it's not right to kill just all the hamster. Maybe It's not like every small animal is going to be infected, right? And they all have their own life. They should not just be killed like this. Some 150 of the pet shop's customers were also sent into quarantine. Award-winning Canadian journalist and author Sam Cooper exposes how Beijing is fueling the fentanyl crisis in the United States. In his interview with the Epoch Times Crossroads, he draws on 10 years of investigation, which he has also documented in detail in his book, Willful Blindness.
One of Canada's top investigative reporters is exposing how a major fentanyl crisis is being fueled in North America. The process includes high-ranking Chinese Communist Party officials, overseas criminal gangs, casinos, and money laundering. Investigative reporter Sam Cooper calls this process the Vancouver model, and here's how it works. It starts with a CCP official who's looking to move his money out of China. Let's say I'm an official in uh, Wuhan. I want to get uh, one million into Vancouver. I make a connection with a loan shark, a gangster in Vancouver. They make a deal. The official travels to Vancouver, meets the gangster in a parking lot. The gangster will give me a million dollars in cash. This is drug cash that's been warehoused in Vancouver from the proceeds of heroin, fentanyl, cocaine sales. In China, there's a law that limits how much money can be exported. So the official has to use underground channels if he wants to move vast amounts of money out of China. But of course, the cash given to the Chinese official from the gangster is not a gift. Rather, it's a loan with interest. But they're going to pay back that debt with a, you know, a very small amount of interest, really quite, quite small considering the service provided. They will pay back where their source of wealth is in Wuhan with a transfer from their Wuhan bank into the gangster's Wuhan bank account. So that money then fund, uh, you know, more fentanyl precursor production in Wuhan, which sends more drugs into uh, the United States or Canada, produces more drug cash, and the cycle repeats. It's loaned out again by... There's the still a problem, though. The $1 million that the gangster gives to the Chinese official is drug money, which means it's in small denominations, like $20 bills. So the Chinese official then goes to a casino to gamble and launder the money. And the official gambles very easily in a government casino. Of course, the casino operator, when they see a transaction of uh, $500,000 in $20 uh, bills, bundles of 10000 wrapped in rubber bands, obviously it's drug money. It's high officials in British Columbia, it appears, did not want to stop this source of revenue. It's proven. Cooper says that the Vancouver model process is how drug money is being moved around the world, including into the U.S. Cities like Vancouver and Toronto have become what we can see as global super nodes of underground banking and money laundering activity. This is how drug money from heroin and fentanyl is moved around the world. The Chinese underground bankers are so prolific, so skilled, so sophisticated at moving money around the world that they have influence over the Mexican cartels, who of course also are being used or, or very willing partners in flooding heroin and fentanyl into the United States. The added U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that more than 100,000 people in the U.S. died of drug overdoses from April 2020 to April 2021. Fentanyl was involved in nearly two-thirds of those deaths. Beijing says it is deeply shocked by Slovenia's new plans with Taiwan. That's the Chinese Foreign Ministry's response on Wednesday, after the European country's Prime Minister said in an interview Monday that he is eyeing plans to open a Taiwanese representative office in Slovenia, a move similar to Lithuania. Uh, actually, we are, we are working to exchange the representatives. He, uh, uh, we, we would have uh, stronger coalitions in former years. Uh, I think we would uh, we would establish such uh, trade uh, representative offices already in the past. The prime minister didn't say what name they're planning to give the representative office. And although the naming of Lithuania's Taiwanese representative office drew ire from Beijing, the Slovenian leader says the name is not important. The prime minister also expressed his position on Taiwan. He acknowledged the island's sovereignty and said Taiwan is the legitimate successor of China, adding that he supports Taiwan's independence. You ask about Taiwan for everybody who knows the history uh, and who knows that the legitimate uh, successor of, of China, uh, you know, <laughs> was what, what was the rest of China uh, escaping to Taiwan, uh, that uh, we, we support the sovereign decision of the, of the Taiwanese people. If uh, Taiwanese people wants to live independently, uh, we have to support also this, uh, this position. 
Chinese state-run media strongly condemned the prime minister's remarks and said he is leading Slovenia into a minefield. In contrast, Taiwan welcomed his comments. A foreign ministry spokeswoman said they appreciate the prime minister's insightful remarks. Starbucks is teaming up with Chinese food delivery giant Meituan. This is an attempt to increase availability and to widen its reach in distributing coffee in the Chinese market. Meituan has over 600 million users on its platform. And on Tuesday, the U.S. coffee chain said it has entered into a partnership with a popular food delivery giant. The collaboration will allow customers to order coffee on Meituan's delivery platform. The move comes as the pandemic has slowed Starbucks sales in China. Also, as competition in the Chinese coffee market intensifies, the director of Shanghai-based China Market Research Group says that Starbucks has enough competition that if a consumer doesn't see their stores available in a chosen app, that they will simply defect to another brand. Starbucks opened its first store in Beijing in 1999. The Chinese market is crucial to the company. As of 2020, it accounted for 10 percent of the company's global revenue. Starbucks has more than 5,000 stores throughout more than 200 Chinese cities. According to its most recent earnings report, the company made nearly $1 billion in China in the third quarter of 2021. In the U.S., if you're from a rural area and want to move to a city, the authorities won't stop you. But it's a different story in China. The Chinese Communist Party says it's the party of the farmers and the working class. In the symbol of communism, the hammer represents workers and the sickle represents farmers. But in the largest communist country in the world today, farmers face one of the most discriminatory systems, specifically China's hukou or residency permit system. The regime put it in place to maintain social stability. But it makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for people from rural areas to move to larger cities. Your who call determines where you're allowed to live. Since around the time the Communist Party took power in China until the 1980s, rural people were forbidden to move to cities. If you were not lucky enough and had rural residency, you were tied to your home village where there could be fewer job opportunities and lower quality education. The restrictions were loosened after China's policy of reform and openness. Hundreds of millions of so-called migrant workers are now allowed to flood into cities to find jobs. But workers from rural areas are still treated as secondary citizens in cities. In some cases, their conditions in their own country are similar to or even worse than illegal immigrants in some sanctuary cities or countries outside China. The farmers turned workers often don't get proper labor contracts. They have to work longer hours under poor conditions, pay much more if they get sick and go to the hospital because they don't have equal access to health care as city residents. And their kids can't go to local public schools. So they either have to go to extremely expensive but low-quality private schools or go back to their hometown for school without their parents to take care of them. Over the past decade or so, the communist regime has repeatedly vowed to reform the hukou system. Some smaller Chinese cities have eased restrictions, but none of the larger cities have. In Beijing, for example, over a third of the population are migrant workers. Due to the city's high property and rent prices, many people live in basements, dangerous buildings, or even makeshift homes. In 2017, a fire broke out in one of those cramped buildings. 19 people were killed, including eight children. The city government then started a campaign to drive what they call the low-end population, mostly migrant workers in low-paying service jobs, out of the city. That's by forcefully demolishing their homes, leaving tens of thousands of people homeless overnight. Chinese authorities, meanwhile, tightened control of the Internet banning related discussions. One Beijing photographer told the New York Times that the forced evictions made him think of Holocaust movies, in which Jewish people were expelled without a word of protest from onlookers. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.